also of crime. So she, what she does is she's simultaneously sleeping, but she's also the crowd of the son who uh, died for the fatherland. Now, in uh, 1991, uh, when Georgia became independent, uh, this is if a uh, change was made in Georgia. <laughs> You see the first version, uh, she has her head uh, in, in the second uh, version, you see that she has already a laurel branch. So she's, she becomes the mother of the nation who is uh, who, who thrives, right? Uh, and uh, you see also these two figures, which, was, uh, which led to anecdotal stories. So people one day walked up and they saw two mothers, so and they thought they become kind of schizophrenic. But it was really two mothers, the one from the older colonial context and another one three of them. And we see that the dead uh, person, that the dead son of the fatherland, became also pater patria, so became father of the fatherland, and he triumphs and he is uh, crowned with a laurel. Uh, branch. Okay, and uh, this is uh, something very important because, uh, as you see, uh, uh, the formula of the father of the nation takes, dates back to the Roman imperial tradition, uh, but uh, it is also something very important in the, uh, in the national context. Uh, the Mount of Georgian monument, so the monument tries on the one hand to celebrate victory in the struggle with the colonial discourse and order, but on the other hand, it also shows that uh, the new order is established. But the new order uses representational mediums of old order, and that's why they, they both, both of them are building in Amaka. And uh, this kind of power has another genealogy, which I also briefly show. Fortunately, it is also a, sh it's a short part, but it's a very famous Soviet poster by Yagli Toidze, uh, Mother Fatherland Calls. Uh, and it was maybe the, the image of the Second World War in the Soviet Union. So we also have in this context the mother who calls her sons to die mm -hmm. in the battle for the fatherland. And we have uh, lots of similar statues. This is in Volgograd or Kiev or of Armenia uh, as well. So you have the whole series of uh, mothers of the homeland who demand uh, sacrifice from their children. Uh, so uh, Toita reactivates this patriotical narrative of the mother who is send sending her sons into the battle of the liberation. But because of the archetypical quality, this image is, well, we can use this image in the whole Soviet Union. And there is also a genealogy, because in both Russian and Georgian contexts, the mother of the particular goes back to the common Orthodox heritage, to the Theotokos, to the mother of God. Uh, and uh, then you have also um, <coughs> Uh, the figure, the father figure of the Soviet Union, and his father figure is the figure of Stalin, who is the pater patria. This was an official version which was inaugurated in the 1936, so he was called the father of nations. And uh, this father of nations is uh, inscribed into different cultural contexts, into the Russian context, and you see here into the Georgian context as well. And uh, uh, also for the father, the mother figure is important. Here you see the figure of Stalin's mother. This is her graveyard, and she's a part of the pantheon where all the prominent uh, Georgian figures are buried. So uh, uh, when Stalin died, the uh, 20th Congress of the Soviet Communist Party condemned the cult of personality, and they start to demolish all the Stalin buildings. But the interesting thing was that uh, somehow Stalin as a symbol of victory was replaced by the figure of the mother. So mother and father again became uh, interchangeable. So what I wanted to say is that uh, in Georgian national context, as well as a more general Soviet context, the figure of the mother turned out to be firmly connected with the figure of the father, creating an amalgam. The triumphant father of the fatherland, Stalin in the Soviet context or different fathers in the national contexts, are visible through the mother. 
The mother demanded sacrifices from her children. Uh, they had to give their lives for the fatherland. Her grief turned into revenge and pride. The figure of the mother turned out to be occupied by this political meaning and did not allow to accentuate the grief that was not convertible into triumph and future victory. The promise that the son will one day become a hero and the father himself. So, and we have uh, now this uh, father figure, the father holding uh, his dead uh, son in his hands. And uh, the prototype for this is uh, Pietà, of course. Do you see here the Byzantine proto version or uh, Michelangelo? Pietà here. Uh, and uh, this uh, grieving father shows uh, another sense. Due to the restrictions, I will not go very deep to this genealogy, but the genealogy goes back first to the Byzantine uh, paradigm. And you see how it uh, is reactivated in Phil. Uh, and in Byzantine versions, uh, here are some, some images which uh, show you the same uh, story. So, uh, in, in Byzantine versions, in Byzantine rhetorics, uh, the lament of the mother of God, the Pietà, the mother is lamenting her uh, uh, dead son, goes back to the classical antiquity. So, they use uh, classical texts for the texts of the mother of God. And one of these, uh, one of the important pretexts is uh, Naiobe. Naiobe was a mother of 12 children, and she was very proud of them, and uh, said that Leto has only two children, Apollo and Artemis, so Leto became angry, she told her children, and she, uh, the gods, Apollo and Artemis, killed all, uh, all Naiobe, all children, so the children of Naiobe. And Naiobe, because of grief, became a rock, a weeping rock. So she was transformed into, if you want to put it in this way, into several kinds, certain kind of, uh, of, uh, of a sculpture. So the grieving father goes back to this uh, sculpture of uh, Naiobe. Both the grieving father and the grieving mother are relating to her figure. However, the connection between Naiobe and the father of soldier mediated by Pietà. So what does the image of grieving father gain or lose in the secular context? The Pietà is inconceivable without uh, the uh, history of salvation. So if you look, mother of God grieving uh, Christ, you always know that the plot uh, continues and at the end of the plot there is resurrection, so he is uh, he's living again. You don't have this uh, certainty in the Soviet the history does not continue, it has an end. This is different than the Fukuyama images. This end is a very bitter, bitter end. So uh, even if in the Soviet context, the Soviet historical narrative invites one to look at mourning from the perspective of the future triumph, it doesn't have any religion's certainty of afterlife. Father's grief, a secularized pietà, testifies to an experience of loss that cannot be transformed into a triumph for vengeance, and which in principle remains non-convertible. The, the, this figure is an attempt to give a form to finality, finality in which it is impossible to think about either the meaning or the future. It is a figure of pure, infinite grief. Like the figure of the mother, the figure of the father is double. The result is four-figure composition. Uh, a mother who is both a common mother and the mother of the nation, and a father who is both father patria, father of fatherland, and a common father. Political mythology and iconography accentuates the political context of motherhood, and the mother is perceived only in her function as the mother of the nation representing the fatherland. In this representative model, the political time is the time of reproduction of heroes, of sons of fatherland whose function is to serve and to die. At the end of the political myth is a triumph, either in the form, in the form of sacrifice or victory. The dead body of the son is converted into a hero. In this model, grief is constantly converted into revenge and triumph and 
is not emphasized. So it is the machine which reproduces hubris. The figure of the grieving father reverses this structure and uh, reveals its subversive side. It is not the father of fatherland who is uh, grieving, it is a common father who represents the grieving mother. And his dead son in his arms represents the suspension of the reproduction of patriotic discourse. A grieving father subverses or subversively criticizes the dominant patriotic discourse. Thank you very much. speak French. Um, let me begin with an apology for the languages, other languages I do not speak behind me, around me. So the only language I have is English. So like Zal, I don't identify as an artist. I attempt to write, I don't know what that means either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do something incredibly fantastic. I'm just going to read from a piece of paper. The title is Eulogy. I will spell it for you. It's E-U-L-O-G-Y. Here we go. Normally, in a eulogy, at the very least, you know why you're in attendance. You're either the friend, a member of the bereaved, the wife, son, daughter, husband, brother, lover. It's a long list, but there's also stranger acquaintance, a gang of exes, ex-wife, ex-boyfriend, ex-mistress, ex-something. Eulogies, like most bike-invite-only parties, have dress codes. Black is popular, short skirts acceptable, as long as flesh is bound by stockings. No slits, nothing too tight, sunglasses okay, one tear, maybe two, just right. But these rules are movie rules, a eulogy without confusion. Write at home in pop culture English, sponsored by a car company or because I like to be unnecessarily provocative, Paris Fashion Week. The aforementioned are eulogy rules for someone like Iron Man or a French politician. These rules will not apply to a Shikari Shambhu, a Captain Majid, or Mohammed Urti Paniparamal Ishmael, megastar, movie star, Hyperstar. If you've never heard of the name, too bad. Eulogies are cosplay or role play. It can be kink, especially if you find kink in wakes or eulogies and you pretend because you want to observe people in the act of pretend. Whether it's people as a unit taking time to care or pretending to care about the loss of someone who used to be an organism with sickness and fetishes and hopes and evil dreams or someone inanimate, like an edifice from history, something with a dungeon or a spire, ruined by cluster bombs or fire. Why pretend? This is a good question. Perhaps there's food at the end, a person you can network with, with or pick up. Some of you post breakfast, post sunrise, post kiss, post gloom, fall into this category. This still does not answer the question of why are we here? And why must we listen to this fool? Which is me, in case you're wondering. Frankly, I'm not sure. I could tell you I have a right to be here because I was invited, vetted, and offered a visa to come here. Perhaps this is enough to intrigue some of you because you like my skin, curls, find my baritone sexy, or you're waiting me out because you want to hear the gentleman who was meant to follow me. But then again, I was supposed to be the first person to speak. So that isn't going to happen either. 
I am away. I have you for another seven to eight minutes. And I suppose that's why eulogies intrigue me. It's performative. There is a platform. It's ritualistic. There are rules. And often only a few among those in attendance actually care or know who the speaker is. Then there is the other rule, probably the most important. To speak, you're often asked by consensus. Or you volunteer yourself to say a few words on behalf of the person or thing that has passed. If you are a parent, you have said a few words on behalf of your child, your little child's goldfish or cat. If you're a writer, you imagine the cat having drowned in a little aquarium after having goldfish for lunch. Then before the eulogy is yet to begin, there is a line about the speaker. You have the pamphlets in front of you. First the name, then what the name means. For instance, my name is Deepak. This is on my bio. What is not on my bio is that I have a fear of crowds, or that I'm interested in languages. And even though I say my name is Deepak, depending on the circumstances, I often need to say more. So again, I say, my name is Deepak. What you say as you contemplate whether I would be comfortable if you lean to kiss both cheeks, as I'm told is a French custom. The first for hello, the second for comfort. So let's try this again. My name is D for Delta, E for Echo, E for Echo, P for Pompidou, A for Alpha, K for coffee. I write one in English, two in English riddled with Malayalam, three in English that refuses to italicize the foreigner if a word could be a foreigner, like the words Ivere or Avare. Four in English that mangles different tongues, laced with Hindi, Malayalam, Arabic, in order to invent new words, or five. If you couldn't follow options one to four, too bad. Let's try this again. My name is B for that, E for any kit, E for any kit, P for paparam, A for Ari, and K for Karini. Let's try this again. My name is B for Doctor, E for Isku, E for Isku. P for Pepsi, A for Arab, and K for Khaliji. Let's try this again. My name is D for distance, E for emigrant, E for expat, A for arrival, and K for compromise. I as Deepak Dibag. My name is also mispronounced as Deepak the Brick. Tupac, Duba. I, as Deepak, am interested in languages, rhythm, sound, how sentences bounce off each other in different cadence and syntax, and what is made in the process. I am from the Gulf, of the Gulf, yet nothing like the Gulf. I'm from Abu Dhabi, not based in or out of, but from. As an apple comes from apple trees, as in Pierre de Saint Marseille, as in Je suis de Abu Dhabi, as in Je suis no French, no understand, very frightened, what a fucking language. I am from people who look like me, yet sound nothing like me, until I start to make sounds that sound like them. This is why I write to produce sounds, to negotiate and navigate spaces that no longer exist or look like what they used to. Je m'appelle Deepak. Je m'appelle inhabitant, je m'appelle resident, worker, maker, writer. I use language to exhume, ghost, and sometimes eulogize the long gone. This address, if you remember, is supposed to be a eulogy. Was supposed to be a eulogy, which is basically a remembrance, which is what my work is about, recalling things, especially what isn't normally articulated in the languages I grew up speaking. The kind of trauma that results from movement, a temporary stoppage of movement and the return home. I was a child in a community that continues to constitute the largest majority in the United Arab Emirates, Indians. I watched family members, relatives, friends of the family, school friends, even strangers, 
age quickly in temporary surroundings. In the process, some of them, especially the immediate family, transformed into things. There is the father who will not speak, the mother struggling with the long-term effects of a parasite, which teleports my amma every night to a future where her parents haven't died in her absence. Then there are the kids who have become masters of disguise. And sound. And the pair bivak. This is not eulogy. This is elegy, lamentation, performance, song. I am writer, son, child, just sweet terrifying, just sweet vulnerable, a liar, a fable teller, master manipulator, just sweet inhabitant, passport holder, passenger, passenger, just fuck sweet. These tones are not mine. And the pere divak. Achan the pere unni krishnu. Elladu and the pere vilkana and ancha. Divak is alfred of Akya. Divak is transnational. Sharia da. Expat. Sharia da. World citizen. Sharia da. You want to know what Sharia da means? It means not. Because I started with English. Let's end with this tongue. In a eulogy, there are photographs. Here, there are none. When Kadista asked me if I have photos to show, and I said none, I probably gave every single one of them a heart attack. This is a visual space. But there are, there's a reason why there are no photographs. In a eulogy, there's supposed to be a sketch. Again, nothing. A name, none. Place, ephemeral. Achievements, most of the time made up and language present. More oral than handwritten though, half-baked, half-built, because I am a storyteller, myth-maker and builder. This is why I'm not to be trusted, why words are baggage, cloak, force fields, sinkholes. When or if I run out of a burning building, when I decide to call Super Taos or Super Sarab, or whether Superman is in the vicinity, Besides other bodies, I must wake, whether I'm sleeping with them or came out of the belly of one. The only thing worth keeping are words. I am the son of ephemeral man and temporary girl. And that chindabede ephemeral man. Now made a temporary girl. This is not eulogy. This is elegy. Thank you for taking the time.
refusal of monumentalism in the wake of monuments. Um, and I have lots of questions for that, but because we're pressed for time, I want to open the floor in case anyone would like to pose a pressing question. And I'm afraid we're going to only take one uh, because we have a shortage of time. And we're going to resume the rest of the day at 2.30 p.m. post-lunch. So if there are any questions, let's have them now. And then we will continue these conversations. Anyone? Um, did, did you have a question? Oh, this is different enough. Okay. No question. Um, but then maybe, maybe I may ask. Uh, very quick. Which is to say that, um, and it's to both of you on, on, on the similar strands, that uh, at least of certain places in the world, there's a refusal of monumentalism and yet a hyperbolic presence through images and fantasies. The Gulf may be one of those. Um, and in, in, the, in the case of your presentation, there was the father and the mother um, and the constant uh, reference to Pieta and the, the sacrifice made. Um, how does one conceive of, of, say, the absence or a silhouette or a, even a contour of a, of a figure, which is a whole. And everything around it is, is constantly being, being produced in order to keep this contour intact. Something that Zahn had referred to in conversations we've had, which is, um, what do we do with these monuments and statues in a post-heroic age? Because those, those monuments still linger around, around but no one's really buying them anymore. Well, well no, definitely. The, uh, but uh, the problem is, uh, or the problem are not the monuments, per se, because uh, what I tried to show also is that uh, there is something which uh, which you can put into different forms, right? Uh, so, but uh, what, what continues is a certain reproductive structure. And you have, uh, as you said, uh, in, in the cases of modern martyrdoms, something continues. So there, are, there is some social energy, which is, as you rightly mentioned, constructed uh, around the gap. And this gap is uh, hidden behind the facade, which we are constantly building by the, by, by the reproduction. You might call this a royal mountain or uh, martyrdom or whatever, but this is a constant reproduction of something which points to something which is not there. And uh, what we maybe need to do, and this is a very Benjaminian thing, is to stop, or to, to, to cut this reproduction. And uh, the interesting things in, in sculptures, for example, or in the monuments, is that they are simultaneously or also something like work, if you want to call them work of art, which is, uh, and they have, uh, they have these cracks, and uh, the, the whole thing to do is just to, 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 to look inside, and then you see the empty thing behind. I mean, I, I don't have an answer to your question, but it's interesting you're asking it, because I'm struck by Shubha's um, presentation, because the diva is an interesting symbol. Because you know, if I were to think of people like me as divers, uh, and you're down there, and all of a sudden, you're so aware of air, but at the same time, if you forget about air, you die. And then the moment you have to sort of resurface, you sort of have to make a decision, what do I take? You, you can't take everything. Uh, and um, you know, I think about individuals who live in Gulf spaces. I don't know how much you know about the Gulf, uh, or whether you should. But I live in Abu Dhabi. I live, up, I live amidst people who stick around for a while and then they leave. But when they leave, what do they take? Um, you can quantify that, like the TV and the furniture. There are other things you can't necessarily quantify. Um, and that's something that I think about. So when Shudra was talking about the diver, um, I was thinking of my father, uh, because he left last year. Uh, and when he left, he left with everything that he had collected over a period of time. But then you also left the thing that you can't necessarily quantify, that you have to remember. 
uh, which is why language is interesting to me because that's something that you can keep you can you can sort of you can sort of take and when I was listening to Zal uh, about you know what these structures and emphasis symbolize they said they symbolize something concrete but at the same time they don't I like the don't part uh, I, I really really do this is my first time that I'm here in France it's my first time in Paris um, and I'm so confused because I don't speak the language uh, and it makes me extremely, extremely vulnerable. But I also find that interesting because I have to force myself to sort of communicate. Uh, I am the joker, so to speak, uh, but I am at the same time the navigator, so to speak. Uh, and I am also someone who understands who's hyper aware of space. Um, and the reason I say all of this is simply because the questions you ask are articulated so well that I don't have a response that can be articulated as well as you've articulated the question. And sometimes I think that's a defense, because that means that I have to give you something definitive to explain the people I write about, to explain the language I write in. Um, that's, that's the best I've got. But there is a short thing uh, like that adds and talk about this time. The